chug, 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 Welcome back to the Wizard Staff. I'm your host, Guy. And I'm Blake. And we are two drunk novices who like to talk about EDH. We drink and swear, so you've been warned. Please drink responsibly when you're talking about children's card games. Man, oh man, has it been a hell of a year. 2020, we said this last year, was going to kick our ass. It kicked our ass. It pub stomped us. It did all the worst things that it could to us. But we are coming out of this better and stronger than ever before. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a doozy. It's been a, it's been a wild ride. Yeah, it's probably nothing that we thought it was going to be from our, you know, speculations of last year. But who could ever really predict something like this, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. So, we are going to be doing our 2020 end-of-the-year review for a commander. And I think what's special about reviewing this year in comparison to years past when we've done these kind of reviews this is the first time that Watsi has come out and said, you know, we are going to make this the year of Commander. 2020 is the year of Commander. And they really try to, like, market it with five new Commander decks with Ikoria, two decks with Zendikar Rising, Commander Legends, Commander decks, and I'm sure if the coronavirus hadn't happened, we would have probably had, I don't know, maybe six, seven different Command Fests all over the country there was probably a lot planned but unfortunately none of that happened so as we go through our set reviews the major highlights that we're going to be hitting on we're just going to kind of be thinking in the back of our heads was this really the year of commander saying it out loud it's it sounds like it's going to be deep and analytical but like we're never really that deep or analytical because <laughs> you know we get pretty drunk halfway through our episode and then it's just like slurring our words and like pretty incoherent so well we are going to go through this year in chronological order and just kind of talk about the most major events and sets and products that were put out this year and i am hoping that this will be a helpful tool whether you're looking back on it one or two years yeah for sure i mean i listen to our yearly reviews because I was like, oh, what even happened last year, 2019? Right. I re-listened to it, and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, these were all the things that happened last year, and it's kind of good that we'll get to, like, just summarize this, and if you just need, like, a good hour and a half episode of what what happened in 2020, I mean, who's ever going to forget, like, what happened in 2020? Like, let's be real. Mm -hmm. All right, but before we get into that, Blake, what are you drinking? I am drinking an Imperial IPA by Voodoo Ranger. It's 9%, and it's halfway decent. I like the marketing of the can. It's very colorful, very, like, hip. Cool. What about you? I have two beers in front of me. I have Elvis Juice by Brewdog. <laughs> it is a Columbus brand. And then I have Columbus Brewing Company just their standard IPA because right now I am in Ohio so trying to you know take advantage of some things that I don't get to have while I'm out in California but yeah I'm familiar with these two brands fun fact about BrewDog but they are they're in Canal Winchester and it's this cool hotel restaurant and like beer factory beer brewing place and you can go there and it's like super dog friendly like i've been there to like just drink or like have dinner with friends and you know they're very welcome to have your dog stay even like in the hotels as well oh my god they have like a big park it, it's awesome like that i definitely recommend so cool. checking it out well especially when we get to travel again like yeah and i know you can like get a keg ordered to your room so that like you know <laughs> let's say i want to stay there and they're like okay what keg do you want in your room you get to choose one of like your favorite 
beers and they'll like just put a keg in there and it's like yep yeah, all right drink it's, it's there amazing. for you yeah it's pretty cool and last thing that we want to do before we <laughs> continue but we want to give a shout out to geo who we gave a shout out to last episode but he went and changed the name of his podcast <laughs> like the next day <laughs> yeah and i was like god damn it geo but he used to be called Mindful Magic, and you might still be able to find some him through that way. But if you're having trouble, you can find him through Samic. Samic? It is S A M M O C. Spent all my money on cards. So go follow him on Twitter. You can find him on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere else that you listen to your podcast. And, you know, just leave him a like and review. Reach out. He's very friendly. He is always asking people on Twitter, like, who wants to play some games on Spell Table? So if you're ever bored, I'm sure that, you know, you'll be able to hit him up and play some games. I need to do that one of these days. Yes, yes. I definitely plan to play more on Spell Table when I get home. But for now, let's get into our review. All right. So, Blake, do you want to start us off with the very first set of the year? Sure thing. So... We're going to start off with Theros Beyond Death. It came out on January 24th of this year, and it included 27 new commanders. And with each of these sets, we're going to read the top four most popular decks according to edhrec.com. That way it kind of gives you a snapshot of what really like rose to the top of those sets. So the most popular commander from this set was Siona, Captain of Phileas. And it's sort of like that Wonder Woman looking card that cares about auras. And then in the number two, we have Heliod, Sun Crowned, Krosa, Titan of Death's Hunger, and Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. And in addition to those popular commander cards, we also got some notable cards that can go into 99, such as Dry of the Elysian Grove, Nyx Bloom Ancient, Underworld Breach, Thassa's Oracle, and Heliod's intervention. Uh, what do you think, guy? This was a great start for the year. People have been asking to go back to Theros, and Watsi was like, you know what? We're going to do it. We're bringing back our favorite white planeswalker, Elspeth. And I mean, I didn't play when original Theros came out, but I was still super invested in this because. We all know Greek mythology, and it was really cool to kind of see some cards that I am familiar with kind of get like a new version of them. Like, you know, the Theros gods all got new cards. Mm -hmm. We also got some really new powerful commanders like Uro and Kroxa. And the 99, I think, had just a huge shakeup with like Thassa's Oracle and Underworld Breach. So I definitely will say that this was a great start to the year. What do you think, Blake? Yeah, I remember when this set came out, and one of the noteworthy things about this set was that Heliod Sun Crowned came out, and it's one of the best mono white commanders that's ever come out so far. And then I was just kind of, you know, sitting over here in Commander Land, and then I was watching every other format kind of crying and burning as like Kroxa and Uro were just, I think mostly Uro was just making every other format like cry. <laughs> So I was just kind of like, I'm just going to stay in this corner over here, keep having fun in <laughs> Commander. Um, that was kind of funny. But um, Commander did have its own issues with uh, the printing of Thassa's Oracle, which kind of broke competitive EDH for a minute there, because what happened was people were already playing Flash plus Protean Hulk combos, and Thassa's Oracle pretty much made it to where all of these Flash Hulk decks, they used to be pretty diverse. Now they only run a certain type of combo package, and it became arguably the most powerful deck at that end of the format. And that's not really something people want. They don't want like a clear best deck, and it really just made games pretty awful for all of the CDH players. And it kind of led to a bunch of <laughs> a little bit of drama, like, oh, do we take seed each player seriously or not and it led to a bunch of that whole mess and i think the other notable card was like underworld breach which in hindsight has really influenced that end of the format as well 
for sure. I mean, Underworld Breach is just such a powerful card in general. <laughs> but I do like what you're saying here with, like, I know, like, Thassa's Oracle did kind of cause some stir up, I guess. But I think even though it wasn't the greatest, it, 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 certainly, it certainly wasn't a card that, I guess, was helping any decks except for this one that just made it, like, like there it was just arguably like if you're going to be playing a deck why aren't you just playing this one because it is the best deck it's no longer like a oh maybe this is going to win or there, there's no debate about it like this is just now the best deck and it's kind of like kind of i don't want to say it's tier zero kind of thing but it's like the only decks that really were going to do anything were just the ones that were built to combat that deck but that's not what you want in like games it's not like oh i mean they're playing the best deck or i'm just playing the best deck to play against the deck you know yeah so with that i think we can move on to the next set that really came out this year which was unsanctioned it kind of actually kind of seems a little bit forgettable to some i actually forgot about this set if i'm being honest it came out february 28th and it was one of those silver border sets that comes out every few years. It's kind of a predecessor to Unglued, Unhinged, and Unstable. It was mostly full of reprints for those previous Silver Border cards, but there were a few new ones. And I still find it worth talking about Silver Border cards. Some people don't, but I find it valuable to talk about them because sometimes designs that are in Silver Border, they might leak over into black border as years go on because silver border really allows r&d to explore spaces and really see is this fine for black border maybe it is maybe it's not so for example like you might also get some easter egg sort of things like surgeon general commander was a card that came out and it teased the mutate mechanic and everyone's like oh my god what's the mutate mechanic what is this and then ikoria came out <laughs> Yeah, I think that is a great example of Silver Border kind of being like the testing rounds, and then cards do maybe end up into Black Border Magic. It's just how do you phrase it in a way that makes it work with the real rules of Magic, where unsanctioned, unglued, those kind of stuff are just kind of like, we're not going to like necessarily throw the rules out the window, but we're going to make it silly and fun. And I think another great example was there used to be a silver border card. I think it was like a red burn damage spell that had trample on it. It was a, I think it was an instant. I'll have to look that up later. But people were like, what exactly about this doesn't work in like black border magic? Like, you know, can't this be a black border card? And, you know, just because of the way that I believe trample is phrased, Sorceries and Instants can't have Trample. But they did then make a card in Ikoria, which this was my segue, <laughs> that was exactly that. It was a red burn spell that had, you know, deals so much damage to a creature, and then all the excessive damage deals damage to the controller. So it worked out perfectly like that. Mm -hmm. So to talk about Ikoria, because it was the next major set of the year, and it was the first set that Watsi had decided to do kind of a alignment with the commander decks. So we got Ikoria, and then we got five commander decks that were designed to be on the world of Ikoria. So there were 70 new cards across um, those five decks that were all, what is it, like, they were on the world of Ikoria. And then uh, all the commanders were on Ikoria, which was really cool because we've never done something like that before. But to talk about like Ikoria first, and then we'll get into like more specifically with Commander 2020. But we had our four main commanders, or sorry, four top commanders Nethroy, Apex of Death, which was one of those mutate legendary creatures. Mm -hmm. We had Kinnon, Bonder Prodigy, Winota, Joiner of Forces. And Rael, the Everwise. And then some notable cards in the 99. Trium Lands. We finished the Ultimatum Cycle with the Wedges. Draneth Magistrate. Whirlwind of Thought. And Migration Path. 
And while Theros was a good start, Ikoria just came in and I think, you know, hit us even harder. Like, <laughs> I remember when we were reviewing Commander 2020 and Ikoria, and we were just like, holy shit, how are we going to do this? <laughs> There's like 50 new commanders all at once. Which yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot, but like, you know, Commander Legends is going to come in and like, <laughs> fuck us up even more after that, but... Just in, so just in Ikoria, we got twenty new commanders, and uh, it was it was just cool that they got to like experiment with something like that. And I hope that they get to do more of that kind of stuff. And I mean, we did see that with like Zendikar Rising, um, Commander Legends. We got some commander decks that were on the planes of what was like coming out at the time, and they even have announced that like Kaldheim. The first set of 2021 is going to have some commander decks. Right. I thought it was kind of funny, again, from a commander perspective, like, oh, companion is fine in this. Oh, format, yeah, I've totally but then forgot it was about messing that for up, a moment. Yeah, it was messing up like every other format. <laughs> and I just felt kind of bad because it's like, it's very clearly that companion like was inspired by the commander format, the idea of having a commander outside of your deck. You could grab it anytime you wanted. That's kind of what inspired Companion, and it kind of ruined other formats, and I just felt a little guilty <laughs> for that. It was fine in our format. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, I also found it a little bit funny that just due to the way timing works, that Space Godzilla Death Corona came out and they had to errata it, because that looks kind of bad. <laughs> yeah, they could definitely not foresee something like that. It's but that is a good timing. point to bring up that they did have the experimental like reskin cards where I think it was 20 maybe 21 different cards from Ikoria kind of got this like alternate art version with a Godzilla character and so in the name it was you know Space Godzilla Def Corona or like Godzilla Primeval Champion or whatever. I've probably messed that up a bit. But and then under it, it would tell you what like this actual magic card was. So it was kind of like cool that they were bringing in other IPs into the world of magic, but still keeping it within the realms of magic. Yeah, like there were definitely some people that did not like non-magic universe ip entering magic in black border it kind of pushed the envelope a bit but you know most people were like all right like this is more or less something that we can flex with and be all right with but don't push it too much more i guess like what after um this has now been out for a while and we've had some time to think about it blake are you comfortable with that idea like if they were to do future things like this like the Godzilla ones, would you be comfortable with that? Or are you more in the realms of like, I don't want to see that kind of thing? I mean, that's a personal preference. It's not my favorite thing, but if someone sits down at a table and wants to play with their like Godzilla skin card, sure. Like it's not my favorite thing, but I'll, I'll sit down and play a game with you. It's not going to like pull me out of the experience that much. Okay, I mean, I feel very much the same way. I do really like Godzilla, and so seeing that come into Magic, I was like, okay, that's pretty cool, and I can get behind it. But I don't. I know that like other fandoms, if they were to do this again, might have different experiences. Like you know, that it might like what if they did? I was about to say My Little Pony, but they've already done that. <laughs> they've um, already done that in Silver Border. <laughs> Uh, but, like, if they did, I don't know, like, I, I mean, I like Marvel superheroes, but, like, if they did something like that, too, like, I would totally be fine, because, like, I know somebody else is going to really enjoy that. It still fits in the realm of magic, because they are just reskins. They're not necessarily unique magic cards that are actually those characters. Epic foreshadow. foreshadowing right there. Epic foreshadowing. <laughs> But before we talk about Commander 2020, this was kind of the other big thing that kind of was like, 
tagged along with Ikoria, but we got some updates to the ban list, which I think actually surprised a lot of us. We got Flash Band, and then Lutri Band, and Lutri was a companion that was preemptively banned on like day zero because of his companion ability where he would have just been an auto include in every blue red deck yeah and people throw around the word auto include a little bit too loosely this is literally the definition of an auto include there is zero downside to including this into any deck that runs red and blue you just you just play it right 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 like there's no reason why you shouldn't run it if you're running blue and red and because there's no there's no choice that it has to be in your deck even as a 99 card like then maybe you have the choice but it's not like affecting the 99 of your deck because it's just like going to be there regardless yeah and people definitely would not have cared much about lutri being banned if he wasn't like the cutest otter in the multiverse yeah, I mean, I hope <laughs> when we re revisit Ikoria, we get another Lutri card, except that it'll be not with the Playable. companion mechanic. <laughs> yeah, so... On that note with companions, Commander did change their companion rules the same oh, as yeah. other formats. Just wanted to add yes. that. I mean, when we look at the, like the stats, and I think we've talked about this, but when we look at the stats of like companion and EDH... It's, like, non-existent. If there was a reason to run your companion, like, there really isn't anymore. I think a lot of people were just going to build those companions as commanders already. Yes, mostly. But the other thing in this announcement was the fact that Flash was banned. Flash is an instant that costs one and a blue and says you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. If you do, sacrifice it unless you pay its mana cost reduced by up to two colorless. So for those of you unaware, I kind of allu like alluded to it earlier that Flash plus Protean Hulk was a strong deck in CDH and the printing of Thassa's Oracle really made it to where, like, this is the number one deck, the most powerful deck, and it really homogenized the format, made it incredibly boring for most of those players. There was a lot of dialogue going on within the community and with the Commander Rules Committee, and it took a few months since Theros Beyond Death came out, but it was decided to ban Flash as the root of the problem. Right. It's not even that it was that big of an effect on the casual community. It was really just a hindrance on the competitive side because, as we yeah mentioned in right. Theros, that it just made the most powerful deck the most powerful deck. And if you weren't going to be playing the most powerful deck, why aren't you? Or the only way that you're going to probably have a good chance at winning is by playing something that's just going to be combating that one specific deck right and the joke became the best way to beat flash hulk is to play flash hulk and when you get that sort of inbred kind of gameplay no matter what format you're at that's usually a sign of unhealthiness yep let's move on because you know normally this is the set that we care most about in the year and it's like the commander pre-con decks the like Ooh, the yes. main ones that they're like focusing on and for your so this is the commander 2020 which we got with the release of ikoria as we've mentioned and so the top four commanders from this this cycle of decks so far is calamax who was the face teamer deck uh zaxara gavi who was the face just guy deck and then Zyrus, the Writhing Storm, who was in the same deck as Calmax. Mm -hmm. And then some notable cards, and I am pretty happy to say, uh, Fierce Guardianship, Deflecting Swat, Deadly Rollick, Flawless Maneuver, Verge Rangers was kind of there, but I think this was the first time in a long time that we got like a good Commander's Matter cycle. Mm -hmm. with the decks where it was like if you control your commander you can cast this card for free 
So Fierce Guardianship was like the big one, Deflecting Swat. Those were like some really powerful cards. But yeah, what do you think, Blake? Well, there's also the other sign, side of the coin, which is that some people didn't like this cycle of free spells if you control your commander. A lot of people don't really like this. It is a very obvious sign of power creep, which some people view as a very big problem currently happening within the format. They don't like the idea of like a, a free counter spell like Fierce Guardianship being in a pre-con. I didn't so much have an issue with the power creep problem, but I did have a problem with the fact that Fierce Guardianship alone did make that specific pre-con it was in like over $90. I think that was like a little overhyped since I, you can now get those decks for a more affordable price. I think it was just kind of like the timing of things because they were saying like, oh yeah, um, there's going to be a little delay because of COVID and all these printing restrictions. So I think people just kind of started to buy those cards like immediately and that's what like drove the price but now i've seen people say like oh yeah you can buy all five commander decks from this year for like 120 dollars, and that's a really good deal yeah and you'll get cards like fierce guardianship deflecting swat in there along with all your like commanders so i know sometimes it doesn't seem like watsi's listening to us but i think watsi is they understanding are. in these times where you know, if there is a demand for the decks due to, like, a lack of printing, they will get those decks out when they can. It's just nobody could foresee those kind of things this year. Right, I, I would agree with that. And I think before we move on, there is one last note I would like to make about this product, which is the fact that it reintroduced the partner with mechanic. A lot of people understand and agree that the original partner mechanic was really broken and adding the restriction of making partner with is a good thing like people really seem to like Paco and Halden, Braylon and Shabraz those were really well received within the community because it's powerful but like not so busted that it made some people mad oh yeah and I like how that also kind of foreshadows a little more in the year but <laughs> we'll get to that later <laughs> Yeah. This year has just been a roller coaster of. Oh my god. Alright. So, the next major thing that happened was. Alright, so this happened with the Command Fests Online that happened. There were three of them throughout the year. And this first one was kind of like a test to see, like, oh, are we going to get people to, like, actually participate in this kind of thing? And it was a huge success. They partnered with Spelltable, which is an online platform that allowed people to play EDH online pretty easily with like cameras, and it was pretty cool. I participated in one of them, mm -hmm. but the first one had some high-level panels where you had like Sheldon, some people from the RC, they did like, you know, some talking and played some games, but one of the big things that came out of that was the announcement of commander's die triggers are going to now work the way that we want them to work so before this year the rule was if your commander died you'd have to have it go to the graveyard in order to get any of the benefits for it dying mm -hmm. so alenda the dust grows i think is one of the most notable ones because it was like oh she has to die in order to get you know your vampire tokens and so people were having a hard time saying, okay, do I want her to die or do I want her to go back to the command zone? But now the rule allows for the commander to go to the graveyard first, then you can get your die triggers. Then you have the option of saying, okay, do I want to like keep her in the graveyard or do I want to put her back in the command zone? And so whenever there is a zone change that isn't hidden, so... Like, if she were to be then shoveled into your library, I believe you would have the ability to, like, put her back into the library. Uh, sorry, back into the command zone if, like, shuffled your graveyard into your deck. But you now have that option 
Yeah, and I think this was a great choice. I think it was incredibly well received by everybody. New players often think that this is that this is how it's worked all along. And I know for a fact, listening to interviews with some of the Commander Advisory Group and the Commander Rules Committee, that Wizards of the Coast has wanted to design cards for Commander, but they've been really hindered by the fact that dies triggers used to not work and now that this rules change they can finally start making all these cool commanders with die triggers and we do start seeing that later on in the year and there was nothing really stopping them from having this before it was just kind of a we need to work through the wording of the rules yeah. to like know how this is going to work and i think yeah this was a great time for them to announce it um, especially with some of the cards that we got later in the year that are going to benefit from getting that choice. Because we've also had cards like Gerard, Weatherlight Captain, Weatherlight Hero, the one that came out in yeah, 2019. exactly. That kind of had to do a little, like, maneuvering of moving places. It, it, it was weird. It yeah. was like, we're trying to make your death trigger work, <laughs> but we can't have it actually the way die. that you want it to work yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so there was another announcement only just like a week or two after this that was watsi announcing the banning of certain like racist cards and then later that day the rules committee came out and said we're doing the exact same thing uh this small list of cards is being banned and i think there was discussion about it for like maybe one or two days and then everyone was like yep we're good with that, and I haven't heard anyone talk about it since. I mean, I don't think any of the cards that were on the list were cards that you see that often just because of their scarcity, and some of them were very pricey. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that they did do this because after looking to, into the history of some of these cards... It's astonishing and appalling that Wizards would let some of these artists make these kind of cards, especially when one of them was a literal fucking Nazi, <laughs> and that's not okay. And I, after learning that, I was like, oh, yeah, um, I'm glad that you're starting to do this, but I don't know. It is just kind of like the first step that they've taken, because there has been a lot of, like, call for Watsi to kind of like diversify their staff and the characters that they are you know promoting mm -hmm. so I will say I don't think at least for the rest of this year I've really seen any kind of like movement to making progress but I know that within their company it does take some time so I'm not trying to necessarily at least say like oh you've only done this one thing and that's kind of it i do want to give you a little bit of time to like try and you know not just uh what's the phrase like you're putting your your actions where your words are or whatever put your money where i your want mouth them is. to make more actions what put your money where your mouth is yeah put your money where your mouth is um <laughs> you're you're saying that you're going to do these things you did this one thing okay that's a good start i guess but I want you to do more and I'm going to give you the time that you know it's you say that it takes you to do a couple of years though we have seen some shifts change pretty quickly so I'm not trying to say that they haven't done anything that we aren't aware of yet but I expect more changes to be coming soon. Well, I think there was one other thing that occurred this year, and I'll talk about that later on in the timeline. But for now, we're going to move on to Corset 2021, which came out in July. The top four commanders from this was Rin and Siri, that cute dog and cat. Then there was Rada, the new Rada, Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose, and Subira, the mono red human shaman. This set had top cards such as Sanctum of All, Garrick's Uprising, Teferi's Ageless Insight, Mangara the Diplomat, Teferi Master of Time, 
Fire Emancipation, and Terror of the Peaks, just to name a few. So, Guy, what are your thoughts on this product? Woof, woof. <laughs> I'm happy that dogs became the default creature type. Oh, That's yeah. That's pretty cool. That was, like, one of the big things. The other big thing that they announced when they were talking about this set was, like, mill was becoming a keyword, and oh, that felt yeah. really cool. So it felt like this was the set where you could have those kind of things happen without it complicating other mechanics that you're trying to focus on because the core set is always something that... It's meant to be like an introduction to players. And I think this set does a really good job of still being that kind of introduction. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like impactability on Commander, it doesn't feel nearly as notable as any of the others. We didn't get that many Commanders. That's fine. We just got like 30, 40 from Ikoria and Commander 2020. So it did feel like kind of a cool down. And I don't think that there are too many cards from the set that I'm like, yeah, these are going to be staples for years to come. Like, I think the only ones that I really think we'll end up seeing a lot are Mangara, because he's a really good draw engine in white, and white doesn't have that many. And really, it'll just be for mono white decks, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. um, Teferi's Age's Insight, I think, is going to be a very powerful card. I just feel like not many people are using it right now. Uh, but actually, that's it. Just those two. Garrick's Uprising, actually. I take that back. That, that <laughs> one, in casual play, looks like it's doing some work. Like, I don't think it's the best card, but I think it is cheap and easy to throw in just any deck that runs green. And it'll do some work. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Where looking back on this set, the commanders aren't really as popular. Like they're not being built as much as from commanders from other sets. But this set did have a lot of interesting cards that go in the main deck. Like you were saying, Garrick's Uprising. Like Teferi's Ageless, Ageless Insight. It had a lot of interesting 99 cards. Yeah, I agree. Cool. I mean, we are always joking about how, like, the core set is the worst set of the year. Oh, <laughs> well, that was just one bad year. <laughs> it was one bad year, and then, like, I don't know, 2020, well, Commander, uh, sorry, core set 2020 was all right. I think it was just our first review for a set, and we didn't know how to review a set. Yeah. So it was just, it, it just sucked for us. <laughs> So we'll always just have like a negative reaction when we see those. I, I am actually really sad to say that we aren't going to get a core set in 2021, which feels weird to say. Like, I'm sad about that, but because we have Caldeheim, Strixhaven, the Dungeon and Dragons set, and then... Um, Innistrad. In, one of the Innistrads, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. So I guess we'll see. I'm sure that... It's just kind of like a, oh, we couldn't fit it in. I'm sure we'll see a return in, what's the next year? 2022, <laughs> for sure. Okay, and so this was pretty cool because this was kind of like a surprise product that we didn't know about until just a little bit before the release. And it was also released very close to the course of 2021. Uh, Jumpstart, which was... A reprints focused set but it was kind of like packs that were focused on a theme so there were like 40 some themes and each of those themes you know you could pull cards from so like elves had a lot of cool new card uh, sorry elves had a lot of co cards that focused around elves there were cards around mills zombies phyrexians dogs cats and you would pull a pack and then you would pull a second pack, you would smash the two together because the packs were a little bigger with some lands in them that would then allow you to make a small deck and then you could just play. So it was a very good introductory set and it came with a lot of reprints like Crater Hoof Behemoth, Ristic Study, Exquisite Blood, Oracle of Moldaya, Linvala Keeper of Silence. Mm-hmm. And it did come with some new cards. I think 
only 20 total yeah very um, few it was very it was very small it was very small but the new cards were in bangers. terms of like the commanders that we care about were tiny bones trinket thief Nayef of the dire hunt Bruvok, the grandolin grandiloquent grandiloquent grand eloquent grand eloquent and inizia Inez? the gale force that's how i say it whatever <laughs> And then, well, Emil the Blessed was also a really good card, but that's, I think, more focused in the 99 mm -hmm. because it's a great combo piece. And then we also got Allosaurus Shepherd. So, yeah, only 20 newish cards. And it was very popular because of the number of reprints. I think the one downside is just people haven't really been able to find it that much yet because of its scarce printing availability. Yeah. But Wasi has said, like, this is a print-to-demand thing, so we are going to print as much of it as we can for as long as we need to. And I think that, you know, it's also a great opportunity because they can always just add new packs to it. Where, you know, if they were like, oh, let's make a new Dragons pack to add to this set. And so they can just, like, maybe make a new Dragon card and then, like, some Dragons that would go into it. And then... You know, you have a deck that could have dragons as well. So, I think Jumpstart is going to be a great product that will follow alongside the core set, or even be just like the introductory set. But that's all for like other times. In terms of like actual commander, though, Alsor Shepherd and Emil, probably the two most notable cards. Very powerful, and I just hope that right now because of their scarcity that they get reprinted enough where the cards of those price the prices of those cards end up dropping a bit i pretty much feel the exact same way i believe it Alsor shepherd peaked at about a hundred dollars and it's currently down to about 75 and i'm hoping it continues to drop i want people to get their hands on this product based on everything i've heard within the community Everyone pretty much agrees that this product was awesome. People really loved all the reprints that were in this product, and they really just wish there was more of it. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit tragic, but it is what it is, and hopefully we see more of it printed in the future. Yeah, I don't have much else I want to say, because it's not like... Well, I mean, I mean, funny story, I guess, to go alongside this, but... I was very drunk when I bought Allosaurus Shepherd, and I was like... No way. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what happens most of the times when I buy my cards. <laughs> is I'm just very drunk, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to buy this. So, <laughs> I don't even know where I was going with this. But, okay, we got Jumpstart, and then we got another reprint <laughs> set, Blake. Uh, what, what did we get? Yeah, we got Double Masters, which came out in August. It was a reprints only set, which again, like the affordability of this format is a growing issue. So I am perfectly happy with the fact that Wizards created a set that was only reprints. I am perfectly happy with that. They had some real awesome choices. They had Cyclonic Rift, Force of Will, Dark Confidant, Noble Hierarch, Mana Crypt, Exploration. They had Doubling Season. Chrome Mox, Box Opal, Sneak Attack, Imperial Recruiter. What else? They had Ad Nauseum, Mana Echoes, Avacyn Angel of Hope, Jace the Mind Sculptor, Land Tax, Avenger of Zendikar, and that's just like the huge, big, notable ones. There were even more reprints. This was awesome. I loved this. Yeah. We weren't expecting this. It was just kind of a, oh yeah, we're doing Master Sets again. And it felt weird because at the end of 2018, they were like, we're not going to do master sets for a while. <laughs> I know, they like went back on their word. They did a little. And I think when I was reading about how they decided that they wanted to do this set, it was like, we were just out. It wasn't like we were, well, it was kind of like, we're out of ideas. What else can we do? And it's like, all right why not a master set and but i think they really nailed it out of the park with this one in comparison to at least masters 25 which was a big letdown true the one at the end of 2018 
Eternal Masters? Is that what it was called? Ultimate Masters. Ultimate mm. Masters was really good as well. Double Masters was pretty good as well. So I think both of them kind of like thumbs up. Like you did a good job. Like I wouldn't mind seeing a master set every other year if they're, it's going to be at this kind of quality. Yeah, if it's at this high of quality reprints, car, like reprints that will actually decrease the price of staples then yeah i would totally be happy if this happened like once every single year i i love it uh-huh the affordability of this format is a growing concern all right so next we're going to move into the next set of this year which was zendikar rising it had 17 new commanders and the most notable ones the top four were omnath locust of creation anawan the rune thief Obun, Moldaya Ancestor, and Akiri, Fearless Voyager. And the top cards, the notable 99 cards, were all of the Pathway Lands, which was the introduction of modal double-faced cards, Feed the Swarm, Ancient Green Warden, Thieving Skydiver, and Scoot Swarm. So, Guy, what was your first impressions of this set? This was, a, I think, another big step for Watsi because of the introduction of the modal double face cards. Agreed. It's the most important mechanic for sure because it's going to be in the next few sets for 2021. I know Kaldeheim and Strixhaven are going to take advantage of that. I don't know for the rest of the year. But it's cool because they're like two in one and it's a very interesting design space they really only... I like how they introduced it here because it was meant to be a card or a land. And that makes sense for Zendikar. But for going forward, they could do a whole bunch of different combinations. Like creature artifact, creature enchantment, creature planeswalker. Mm -hmm. Like... There are a lot of combinations that they can do, and so it will be exciting to see how far they try and push it. I am actually very surprised at just, like, how many of these people are using. Because, to me, it's not the most efficient. Like, the only ones that I thought were worth noting or worth putting in decks were the mythic ones. Mm -hmm. Where you had the option to have the lands enter in untapped. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, I hope that the modal double face cards make a bigger impact this coming year. And we'll see. We've seen a little bit of Kaldeheim, but we're not going to be talking about that right now. Yeah, okay. So to talk about, I guess, Zendikar, and aside from the modal double face cards, it doesn't feel as prominent. Like, it didn't have as big of an impact as some of these other sets that we've had so far. You don't think so? I don't, I don't think so. In at least comparison to like Theros and Ikoria, which I, granted, like those two set the bar really high, <laughs> like really high. And then like Korra said, twenty twenty one was like a good like kind of let's calm down a little. And then Zenikar Rising like stepped above Korra said twenty twenty one a little, but not as much as like Ikoria did. And cards like Thieving Skydiver. And I mean, that's really the only one that I can think of that was like, people are going to talk about this and it's going to be a card that runs in every blue deck. But I don't know, like, I don't think that's actually true. Like, it doesn't seem like there's many cards coming out of this set that are actually worth talking about right now. Yeah, I would agree with that. I was kind of, <laughs> I know I've said it for other sets and i'm going to say it again but again this is one of those sets where it like caused problems with other formats and again i'm over just here in commander i'm like i'm just gonna keep doing my thing like maybe the fact that four color omnath was banned in every other format that it's like the number one most built commander from this set it's like oh i can't play four color omnath in any other format besides commander i guess i'll build it in commander i do think it is worth noting that omnath is like far and above built way more than any other commander from the set and the next 
closest ones are the two commander decks that came in conjunction with Zendikar set. I will say I do think a big part of that is because Omnath is four colors, and we don't get to see a lot of four color commanders. True. So he kind of is an outlier, and he already is a popular character. Mm -hmm. So... And it's an easy strategy. Like, it's Lanifall. <laughs> They're always going to be caring play about lands. Like, lands coming into play. Right. So, I'm, I guess I'm not shocked that he's the most popular. And I'll be interested to see, I guess, like, in the future, what are the... If anyone else came out of the set to be really popular, or if anyone makes as big of an impact. But, yeah, I hope we get more four-color commanders, at least. Yeah, I also hope that we can see more four-color commanders that aren't based in partner, because we don't need more of those. Yeah, and I guess the only other thing, well, two other things. The one thing that I'm going to mention with Zendikar Rising, it introduced the list. And they say it in a much more dramatic voice than I do. But the list is a list of cards that is included into the set booster packs that they've introduced with Cinder Rising. And there is a 1 in 4 chance of you pulling a card from the list. And it's like if you pulled a card from a mystery booster where there's going to be a little like symbol down in the left hand corner. It's just a bunch of reprints from over the years. I think some of the most notable ones are like Scroll Rack, Food Chain, yeah, I actually don't think that there's any others that are, like, that notable. But it's a cool way because, at least moving forward in the future, they will be, like, taking cards on and off the list. So, with Kaldeheim, they've already announced, like, oh, we're going to take these 30 cards off, but put these 30 cards on. So, if there are cards that we want reprinted, there is a chance that they'll go on the list... And even though they won't be the most functional reprints ever, like, because, you know, they're still pretty expensive, we're still going to get more of those cards. And actually, that does remind me, uh, we did get the return of the Zendikar um, Expeditions, which was kind of notable as well, because we had all the fetch lands. Um, oh, yeah. We got reprints of the Battle Bond lands. Ancient Tomb, Cavern of Souls. Yeah, those were pretty cool. Kind of forgot about it, because it's not like functional reprints where they're going to be on demand it's just reprints at a still scarcity and at a, like kind of the bling level where they were a premium product right it's it's a premium product so it's not like it's not affordable everyone is going to have a chance to get them right 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 yeah that was one of the major critiques still kind of cool i guess all right, so the next major event that happened this year was, how should I say, an update to how Wizards of the Coast does storytelling. Over this last about year, there's been critiques of Wizards of the Coast putting stories in ebooks and hard copy books, and the system that they were using wasn't producing very high quality stories. People did not like the stories, they were very boring. And so, WotC decided to move the story online, starting around Zendikar Rising. And since then, I'll admit, because it's free, like I've started reading the, the lore now, and I feel like it is beneficial to me simply because I get to see another dynamic of this trading card game. I feel like I'm more knowledgeable about how WotC designs cards from a lore perspective at the very least. So, and I know that there are certain people who really enjoy the lore just for the fact that there's cool fantasy lore. And there's some people who build entire content creation channels based around the lore. So I'm hoping that this continues, that it's free, that it's accessible to most people. I hope that I get more into the lore. I didn't read any of the Zendikar Rising stuff just because I wanted it to kind of like come out all at the same time and then read it. But that might be something that I do now with some spare time as well. Okay, wow, 
Okay, this is probably the hottest thing of the year if you want to take over for this <laughs> one, Blake. Uh, I suppose. Okay, so we come to... Because I'm going to just drink the entire time that you're talking. Oh, gosh. So we come to October, and it introduced the Walking Dead secret layer, And so the secret layers have been a thing for a little over a year now. And they are special products from WotC themselves and is the closest thing to WotC selling singles directly to the customers. They come out about once or twice a month at this rate. There's like been about 33 secret layers throughout the year of 2020. But in October, we got the Walking Dead secret layer, which contained the first mechanically unique cards in Black Border. Uh, before this, it had only ever been reprints that occurred in secret layers and people were fine with that so we had cards such as rick daryl glenn we got some walker tokens which are technically zombies and then we got like negan so the only way to obtain these cards was through the secret layer and once the opportunity to buy the secret layer was gone that's it you couldn't buy them anymore there was a lot of outcry about this product and there were multiple critiques and problems about this product, mostly the fact that if you missed out, you missed out. The fact that they were mechanically unique cards in Black Border, which I view as the key issue. People didn't like The Walking Dead crossing over into Magic the Gathering as an IP sort of thing. Then there's also the issue with Negan being a rapist. It's also limited availability due to secret layers being sent out granted there's been some discussion about this topic and like it's not as restricted as people the players once thought but it is still somewhat restricted compared to if these cards were just in a normal set and there's also the whole price barrier of being a premium product secret layer so overall there was a lot of uh negativity about this set from the player base uh, so as of right now, none of the cards were banned. The RC has said that they will continue to observe what happens with these cards, but it's unlikely that they will need to ban these cards because it was set a bad precedent, and we here at the Wizard Staff Podcast agree with that idea. So overall, it's just kind of a, a sucky situation. <laughs> yeah, and I know... The product is just now getting into the hands of players. I've seen people talk about how they're getting their secret layers. And it's kind of hard to make a call when it's like, oh, we need to ban these cards when you're not even going to have them for two to three months later. So it's because what if, you know, you spent your money, but then, oh, I can't play with this because they decided to ban them and I've already made the product and there's no refunds on this kind of thing so yeah I know that they've had talks about it like on twitch streams and it doesn't seem like that they are going to be um, shy from doing this again I do think that they will be a little more cautious but I was hoping, I guess, when I heard that the Walking Dead Secret Lair was going to be coming out, that it was going to be similar to Godzilla, where, you know, you had the skins of uh, pre-existing cards, but they were Walking Dead versions. Like, it almost seemed, like, pretty obvious that that was going to be the thing. But that wasn't the case. So, I don't know. Yeah, it was that was definitely part of the dialogue where people were like, we were okay with Ikoria Godzilla showcase cards, but this is pushing the envelope too far. This is too much for us. We are not okay with this. And like you said earlier, Watsi has gone on and made statements like this is the best selling secret layer. And based on other things they've said, unfortunately, I think we're going to see more of this product in the future. And I, that is really disheartening to hear. I don't think that this is a good product for the health of the format. And then as a result of this product coming out, a lot of people were angry and sad and resulted in a fracturing of some players and temporarily created the captain format, 
which was kind of like a revolt against the rules committee for not banning these cards. And luckily it didn't really gain much momentum. It was like destroyed and collapsed in on itself within like three days or something but those three days in my opinion were like the spiritual low point of the format like based on screenshots i've seen of the captain discord it was just toxic as all hell and just everyone was so unhappy and so mad and i was just i was sad about it yeah it's one of those situations where things got out of hand really quickly and it was only spiraled because a major content creator had a big part in it as well yeah he created it right so i know that he has himself distanced himself away from captain but yeah and he has a formally apologized but even still it leaves a bad taste in my mouth my opinion of him i don't know this is a commander podcast and we don't want to support anyone who partakes in that kind of like toxic environment yep so why don't you talk about the next set well i'm glad that you've passed this off to me blake because it is the biggest set of the year (laughs) commander legends came out on november 20th we got 73 new commanders 40 of those had partner the original partner mechanic now the top four without partner were obeka Brute Chronologist, Arami of the Dead Tide, Yurlock of Scorch Thrush, and again, Arcanum Weaver. Go check out our podcast that we just did about him. <laughs> and then the top four with partner have been Rog Rock, Son of Rogoth, Sakashima of a Thousand Faces, Kodama of the East Tree, and Arden, Intrepid Archaeologist. And then the top new cards that have come out of this have been the new Battle Bond lands. Oh, yeah. So, from original Battle Bond, we got the five ally colored lands that say, like, this can enter the battlefield untapped if you have more than two opponents. And they finish the cycle here with the enemy versions. So, we got red, white, blue, red, cream, black, black, white. And then blue green. So we got those five: Hole Breacher, Opposition Agent, Wheel of Misfortune, and then some other card called like Jeweled Lotus. Who cares? <laughs> so this was teased to be like the biggest set of Commander 2020, and I have to say, like, did it deliver? For the most part, yeah. We got some very powerful new cards like Jeweled Lotus, Hole Breacher, Opposition Agent. We got the Return of the Partner Mechanic, which I know people were very skeptical about, but they approached it in a much better way where it was only monocolored legends that got partner. Yeah. And now that there's a greater diversity of partners, I think that helps with who your partners are going to be and especially CEDH because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to be seeing the same 16 commanders it makes it much more diverse like I think there's over 1500 some combinations now between the 56 yeah there's a lot more combinations now oh yeah I think the one downside because this set was like for the most part a slam dunk but the biggest downside is that it was teased that white was going to get the help that it deserved and i still stand by really strongly that it did not get the help it deserved and the best way to explain is within a recent tweet that i did the three biggest mythic white cards from commander's legends are 50 cents but if you look at Commander Legends, a card like Kodama's Reach is 75 cents. Why is that? Well, Kodama's Reach is a card that goes in every single green deck. No questions. Yeah, some exceptions, but yeah. The exceptions are so marginal. The, the white cards, though, that were, like, mythic are very catered towards specific strategies. And they aren't helping with the weaknesses of 
white. So nobody really wants them and they're not really doing anything that is unique to white that we haven't already seen before. So you know Archon of Coronation is just like another body to get you monarch and like help you not lose damage but it doesn't do much seraph great sword has too many restrictions to like actually make some angels and then triumphant reckoning is just a super big sorcery to just return a bunch of cards from your graveyard to the battlefield and those aren't necessarily things that like white needs help with because white has always needed help with the ramp and draw. And that's what we were looking for. And really the only card that kind of delivered on that was like Keeper of the Cord. So it's disappointing to say because when sets care about standard, it's a little harder to kind of like not break the color pie, but like shift the color pie in a way where you can be experimental. But here, I don't think that they were as experimental with white and gave them the tools that they needed to be a better mono color. Because it's always been kind of the joke that like mono white is a supporting color, and I still think that's true. Yeah, I somewhat agree with that. Watsi's explained why they are so slow in developing powerful cards for certain colors for, say, the commander format. It's taken them years to make mono red cards that are beneficial so i am personally just kind of waiting over the next like two or even three years to receive these powerful mono white cards <laughs> if i'm being honest that's the timeline i'm on we'll see i guess when it was like a bullet point on their presentation about commander legends it was like okay we're probably gonna get a few but i think really keeper of the cord is the only one that I'm like, okay, I might run this in my like mono white deck. And I mean, that's the point, right? Is like they slowly take a step, see if it causes any problems. If not, they take another step. That's good. Okay, let's take another step. They're very slow, methodical. They aren't just gonna print something busted that's maybe gonna like ban something, even in Commander. It's, it's honestly kind of hard to ban something in Commander, relatively speaking, in relation to Magic the Gathering formats. So they're very slow, they're very methodical. Overall, I, I agree with you, Guy, that this set was a home run. The only three cards that caused any amount of ruckus was Jeweled Lotus, Hole Breacher, and Opposition Agent. Besides those three cards, I think people were like ecstatic about this set. They might have felt a little bit overwhelmed, a bit of product fatigue at this point, because the year is almost over, but Overall, I would personally say that this was the spiritual high point of the format simply because all of these new partners did not like break the format. It allows a huge amount of creativity. A lot of the non-partner commanders like Obeka, like Yurlok, like Gen are super unique design spaces that have never existed before and that's the kind of design that most commander players would agree that's what that's what we want to see we want to see new stuff we don't want to see stuff that replaces old stuff we want to see new design spaces new ways to play and this set did that yeah and i totally agree like they did a good job about introducing some characters that we haven't seen before and some color identities and having strategies that are like shifted you know you had gen who was the mardu like enchantment matters deck or Obeka, which is a, I don't even know what the color, the three color pair for that, but it's like, Grixis. She, ca she cares very much about, what is it? Grixis. Grixis, yeah. She cares very much about like, end of the turn shenanigans. It's a very, you wouldn't see those kind of things because in standard, if you were to print Obeka as she is, you would have wanted to make sure that there were a bunch of cards that mattered about end of the turn. But in Commander Legends, you know, you're going to take Obeka. You might care about her in the draft format for a little bit. But then you can also, like, expand upon that and, like, do some really cool things. Yeah. Next up in this year, we're coming 
to the end of the year. We're wrapping up here more or less. We have Commander Collection Green, which came out in December. It was delayed. It was expected to come out earlier in this year, but again, because of COVID, it was delayed to December. Uh, this is the first series of products that WotC plans to unveil where they will be reprinting eight cards that are meant as staples to the Commander format and can be a good way to get players into the game. So it included Soul Ring, Command Tower, Worldly Tutor, the first time being reprinted in foil, and a reprint in general. It had Bane of Progress, uh, the Fraley's Planeswalker card, Omnath Locus of Mana, Sylvan Library, and Seedborn Muse. It had a lot of pretty great cards, I'd say. Oh yeah. I know that you and I have this little competition to see who could guess the number <laughs> of cards correctly from this, and we both failed miserably. <laughs> we did. I, I hope we see more products like this where they're able to reprint some powerful cards in a an accessible way. But to me, this wasn't the best because it doesn't feel as accessible as some other reprint sets just because i've had trouble finding like good prices for some of these like foil versions if i'm being honest but like in total like they did a good job i just think that they need to print more of it i guess yeah i mean i'll tell you a quick story i went to an lgs recently and I talked with the store owner for about half an hour, and we talked about this product, Commander Collection Green, and how they only had the non-foil product, because in order to get the foil product, you had to be one of these like highly qualified stores that has to basically jump through a bunch of hoops. You have to meet certain qualifiers, like the number of people that come into your store on a regular basis, and a bunch of other criteria in order to get this truly premium product. And I just kind of felt bad for him because it's like you live in a rural enough area that it's really hard to meet all of these criteria just to even be eligible. So it's super hard to find these like foiled versions of Commander Collection Green, which as a invested Magic the Gathering player, I'm kind of at the point where like, if I'm gonna buy a card, I really want to be in foil if possible. Um, I know not everyone agrees, that's just me personally. And so for me personally, it was like kind of disheartening because I wanted to support the LGS. That's kind of like one of the ideas of this product. And at least for me, I couldn't really do that. Yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, two more big kind of like notable events, I guess. Okay, so on December 8th, WotC put out an article that explained some of their stories may be regionally blocked in order to tell diverse stories, which it's kind of hard to understand, but basically they are telling whatever kind of stories they want to tell, whether that includes like characters who are like bisexual or gay or whatever, they're going to tell those stories and they may have to block those stories in certain regions due to international laws. And this was done because, again, a lot of lore-based people who cares about that aspect of Magic the Gathering were, were, have been, in my opinion, fairly critiquing them of like, hey, why are you doing this? It kind of seems hypocritical to some of the messages that you say in terms of you are in support of diversity and like equality. So they put out this article. I overall think it's a, another small step in the right direction. Again, this is a very slow process. I think overall it's a good thing, and I haven't really heard anyone say that this is negative. No one important anyway. Yeah, and I know that with Kaldeheim, they are introducing one of their first non-binary main characters. Like, the character will go by the they-them pronouns, which is I feel is a great step in the right direction as well but i do hope that it's just not like kind of like a oh yeah we're just making this character this for some reason i hope that they get to kind of explore the character as much as they would with like anyone else that they would have yep i mean that's always the concern we have whenever these kinds of annou announcements come out that it's just lip service and that they're not actually going to commit to it so i guess we'll just have to wait and see and kind of 
keep them responsible to what they say and promise. Yeah. And then the last major thing that we've kind of talked about already a little bit, we did have three command fests, but they were all online due to the coronavirus. Uh, many in-person magic events have been canceled and are likely to be canceled for another year as well. So Watsi's partnered with Channel Fireball and Spell Table to bring us Command Fest online, which has been great for people to just hop on Discord, request a game, and then play over webcam EDH. I've done it a couple times, and I do think it's a lot of fun. I was able to just play 10 games in a day, and just due to small issues, it's kind of like, it really just depends on, like, I guess who you're partnered with at partnered up with because of their internet but you know i feel like the best kind of games are like where your understanding of like what others are kind of like going through but yeah i mean they're two days and they still do a lot as well on like the sides whether it's the chats with the rc or people like gavin it's pretty cool yeah, I've actually seen a lot of people talk about the fact that they've played more Magic this year than they normally would because for them personally, being able to play games online is actually more accessible to them than having to drive to an LGS and play with people in person or a Command Fest online. So I have seen some people say like, this was actually a year in which they played more Commander than ever, which is kind of awesome in a way. You know, try and make the most of a bad situation. I will say, man, like, I was really looking forward to maybe trying to coordinate with you and meet up at a command fest somewhere, but I might just have to wait till, like, 2021 or maybe even 2022. We'll have to see. I mean, yeah, I don't think going to in-person magic events will be something that we can do anytime soon, but, like, I'm sure we could plan our, like, own mini command fest <laughs> once vaccines are more accessible you know gotta hope yeah all right so now that we've kind of talked about all the major events of the year we're gonna just kind of delve in a little into kind of like the the highlights or what we would say the highlights are so what do we think the best set of 2020 is and i'll give my thoughts i would say commander legends is the best set at least for commander this year Despite the fact that we didn't receive some of those powerful white cards that we were expecting, that I just mentioned, the set was made for the multiplayer format and it definitely shows, and it's a good thing that this set is print to demand, which means that we'll hopefully get to see this set continue to be reprinted for the foreseeable future, and a lot of the cards that are kind of like at the high, high dollar value, like Jeweled Lotus, Vampiric Tutor, Mana Drain, we hope that we get enough of those that, you know, they'll still be accessible for times to come, even when Watsi isn't going to be printing the set anymore. And I know that the set's been very successful so far, but it probably means that they're going to be doing a second one of these sometime in the future. Yeah, I also agree with you in the fact that I think Commander Legends was the best set of this year. It really did just give us, the players, a whole variety of truly unique decks and with the partner mechanic, just so many different possible combinations that people are still brewing and still trying to like find creative decks to build. I don't think it's just the fact that this is like the most recent set that came out and I'm just like caught up in the hype culture. I really do feel like when I look back in one or two years, I could say with confidence that Commander Legends is the best set of this year. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I know that we just agreed on that, so I feel like there's not much worth talking about there. So we're going to get into the hot topic debate of what's the most powerful card of 2020. <laughs> and we have a lot of potential contenders. I did a Twitter poll for each color and then artifact. So for red, I put down Underworld Breach, Jessica's Will, Deflecting Swat. For blue, Thassa's Oracle, Fierce Guardianship, Hole Breacher, 
black opposition agent deadly relic feed the swarm green agent green warden reshape the earth nick spoon ancient outsource shepherd for white we had flawless maneuver a chroma's will draneth magistrate artifact litho form engine jeweled lotus and the ozolith and then in terms of just like reprint as well this was kind of interesting because i was very curious like what's probably the most appreciated reprint of the year we got it we got a few like vampiric tuner scroll rack force of will mana drain like those are all like high dollar cards in general but what's surprising to me was that three visits was actually the most appreciated reprint because it was reprinted at uncommon because it's essentially kodama's reach just kind of um what's the word functionally reprinted so that was cool because it's a card that's normally a lot of money but they were able to reprint it at a way that it became such a value that it's affordable to everyone it went from being about a hundred dollars to being about three dollars and it also shows when you look at like the original portals three kingdom version that's still holding some value if you want to buy that version but they reprinted it so that more people could have access to like the cheaper version you know mm -hmm. all right so we got a lot of contenders for best card of the year blake i don't know if you want to go first but i already know what i want to say for the best card of the year <laughs> I, I, I feel like you're just bursting, like, ready to say it, so why don't you say it first? Alright, well, to me, it's almost undisputed, but Underworld Breach is the best card of the year, and let me tell you why. <laughs> it is a cheap enchantment spell that can just be splashed in every red deck, doesn't matter the power level, and it's going to gain you value. And to me, that's what's most important. It doesn't matter how good it is in the power level of the deck. It's always going to be able to be played and do some work. I think it sees so much play in CDH. It sees it could see play in casual as well because you can just always gain some value off of it. And it costs so little that it's almost not a big downside. It opens up so many lines, and I just think it is probably the best card of the year, followed probably by Jeweled Lotus, then probably Thassa's Oracle. <laughs> That's just me. I'm kind of inclined to agree. It can be played in any like deck that has red in it, whether it's like competitive EDH, in which it's one of the best ways to win right now or whether you're just playing it a little bit more casually as generically good reanimation i think we could we could probably make a whole separate episode arguing like what's the most powerful card but that that's too long so overall i think we can both like for a certain agree and most people listening will agree that this year had some very very powerful cards and I'm not going to say like we didn't have some powerful cards in every color because we got Draenef Magistrate, which I think is probably the best white card of the year because it can be splashed into every white deck and it's an asymmetrical effect that hinders your opponents from casting their commanders. So, Guy, was this the year of commander? It was the year of commander for as best as it could be. What I mean by that is 2020 was like a shit show if it wasn't if you didn't like take magic into account at all just with coronavirus and just so many other things but it did kind of put a damper on what we could do together as like a community but for as much as we could do still it probably was the year of commander i guess like in relative terms, sure. It could have been better, but given the circumstances, it was the year commander. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, like, we got some really good red cards, like Underworld Breach, and many others, 
White is slowly, slowly getting support. May take another few years. I think one of the major developments that happened this year that we haven't talked about is the fact that there is a more positive perception of CEDH, competitive EDH players and that end of the format, which I think is a good thing because they are part of the format. The format is like, we're all in this together. We might have slightly different play styles, but we're all playing the same format. And that's mostly due to the fact that there's been an explosion of content creators on YouTube that are, like, I think clearing up a lot of misconceptions and just putting a more positive light on that end of the format. There's also kind of the issue which happened this year, which is like product fatigue. I think, unfortunately, Wizards has looked at the Commander format and has, like, given us, like, way too much to eat. It's like... I don't know, you get a pizza and you're like, oh sweet, I like, I can eat this whole pizza over like the course of a few hours, but like, you got misdelivered like six pizzas and you're just like, what the hell am I going to do with all these pizzas? I can't eat all this and you're just trying and you're just miserable. Some people would definitely feel that way. I just want to say like, personally, the amount of products we got for me is fine this year because of the coronavirus because we couldn't kind of like enjoy the product for a long period of time it's like once we like got the set spoiled and we got to see the cards and like after three weeks it was like okay what's next like i can't really enjoy this too much without being entertained with something else so i was always happy that we were getting more products personally i don't think that's like the mindset of everyone else though so yeah yeah and i think one of the final concerns is just the affordability which again looking back on this year I was actually like oh yeah there were actually like a lot of really good reprints I, I think the question is always can WotC keep up with the demand can WotC print these like highly desired reprints that will lower the price and make this format affordable that's always something that's going to be asked every single year not just this year and then there's also the concern about power creep me personally, I think it's a concern, but not as big of a concern as a lot of people make it out to be. Again, I think that's an issue that we have to ask over a multitude of years, not just this year, but overall, yeah, it totally was the year of Commander. We got a fuck ton of Commander <laughs> products. Oh yeah. And I'm sure we'll get some more this coming year, but yeah, I, I from what they've said, I am excited for 2021. I hope we get to enjoy it as much as we can, and I hope that we can do it in a safe and respectful way. It feels weird because looking back on 2019, we didn't expect a lot of this, but I think overall, we did the best that we can with the cards that were dealt, I guess. Just like a card game. Exactly. I didn't mean to make that analogy, <laughs> but I, I nailed it, man. Can I mulligan this year? <laughs> can, can you mulligan this year? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Tell, let me know how that goes. <laughs> All right. So we are the Wizard Staff Podcast. We are on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else that you listen to your podcast. You can find us on Twitter at WizardStaff101. You can find us on Instagram at the same handle. And you can send us an email at thewizardstaff101 at gmail.com if you want to bitch and complain about how stupid we are. We hope you had a great time listening, and we do want to mention, but we will not be putting out any new episodes until probably mid-January of next year. We hope that you get to spend some time with your families, and we hope that you get to do so safe and you come into 2021 healthy and happy. We appreciate all of you who have listened and supported us throughout the years, and we are excited to see what is to come in 2021. So we'll see you soon. Peace. Peace.